Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the very third session of Principles of Management course. I am Dr. Shikha N. Khera, faculty at Delhi School of Management, Delhi Technological University. Students, we discussed in the previous two sessions about the introduction to management, various functions and principles. So today, we will take up in this module, the development of management thought and a historical perspective. This particular module has been divided into two categories, part 1 and part 2. In this part 1 module, we shall be discussing about the term manager, its emergence, roots of historical background which dates back to early centuries and followed by certain theories like classical theory of management. So let us begin this session and try to have an insight into the development of management thought. Let us begin this session with an anecdote. This anecdote is about Mr. Aditya Birla whose history dates back to 19th century when said Shiv Narayan Birla commenced trading in cotton. He expanded the business quickly even during India's hardest times of 1850. During the early part of 20th century, Mr. Ghansham Das Birla, the group's founding father, set up industries in critical sectors such as textiles, fiber, aluminium, cement and chemicals. Understandably, Mr. Ghansham Das Birla emerged as one of the foremost industrialists of pre-independent era. The business and managerial beliefs and principles of Mr. Ghansham Das Birla became the beckon light for entire group. His grandson, Mr. Aditya Vikram Birla, was the first to put Indian business on the world map. As far as back in 1969, that is long before the globalization of Indian economy, Aditya Birla was professional, modern and forward-looking. He believed that a business could be global and successful while still being based in India. His son Kumar Mangalam Birla is now the chairman of Aditya Birla Group. Under his leadership, Aditya Birla Group enjoys a position of leadership in all the major sectors in which it operates. Today, the Aditya Villa Group is part of the Fortune 500 list and it has a workforce of over 1,33,000 employees belonging to 41 different nationalities. A firm practitioner of trusteeship concept Kumar Mangalam Villa has institutionalized the concept of caring and giving at the Aditya Villa Group. Now, Further, the business strategies that Mr. Kumar Mangalam Birla has propagated or is following includes achieving accelerated growth, building meritocracy and enhancing stakeholder value. The evolution of managerial belief and practices seen through the prism of Birla family can provide a perfect setting for discussing the evolution and environment of management in this module. Further, the evolution of management process began since the man started living in groups. He started arranging for the masses wherein the intellectual capabilities were exchanged, the physical resources were exchanged and the man started over looking after or looking over all the processes which were taking place. It is at this point in time when the birth of the concept of management or manager started off. Let us see in detail. Managers therefore then expect to ensure greater productivity using the current jargon of continuous improvement since those times. The existing management thoughts are the results of 
cumulative and conscious efforts of various management thinkers to help businesses stay efficient and effective, viable at different times and conditions. These thinkers constantly searched for organizational structure and behavior that can guarantee the organization's success. So when we talk about organization structure, we are talking about whether we wish to go for a flat or a tall structure. And emphasizing upon organization behavior, we wish to highlight how individual and group behavior affects the performance and productivity in the organization. These thinkers, they developed concepts, principles and philosophies that help the managers to make things happen to get the desired results and satisfy the customers and generate surplus and create value for both, value for both the internal customer that is employees and for the external customers. Management theories also focused on the ways and means of utilizing the organizational resources effectively. So this is one of the prominent issues that we need to discuss that how the management thinkers with the help of various experimentations and deriving theories help the contemporary management practices to come up with the best ways to handle all the work to be done by the organization in highly effective manner. Management is a field that has grown steadily over a period of time to emerge today as an indispensable part of an organization. It now has a strong and mature theoretical base with a lot of practical implications and certainly the present day management thinking has evolved over a very long period of time and has been influenced by different cultures, ideologies and circumstances that had prevailed during different eras. So having said that, that we, the, the, all the thinkers who came up with various theories, it was the history at that time, their interest areas, their research interest fields and the situational situations around them which prompted them to come up in their own perspective various different theories. The primary aim of management thinkers and practitioners in developing new management theories and practices is to suggest one best way to organize business and deal with the management problems. These are very critical issues, how to deal with the management problems and since ages the managers are facing or are trying to find out the best ways to handle such issues. Interestingly, most problems of today's managers are the same as those faced by the managers of erstwhile periods. Such continuity in the manager functions and issues make the management practices and principles always relevant and time tested. Hence, it is essential to trace and understand the origin and growth of management thoughts that may have valuable lessons and inspirations for the present and the future managers. Having some background from historical literature, so it says management is primarily a mental activity. As such, it is a kind of activity that must be done by people alone and cannot be delegated to the care of machines. The nature, extent and efficacy of management has a direct impact on how well a task is carried out. So managerial activities were the inherent aspects of almost all the great works that required the mobilization and maintenance of large chunk of people for a long period of time. So even during the ancient times, managers played a pivotal role in conception and accomplishment of mega works such as building monuments, founding cities, creating huge business enterprises, establishing religious and educational institutions. <coughs> and out of these, if we may talk of the Egyptian pyramids, Great Wall of China, 
Taj Mahal, they are all the examples of great management execution even the pre in the pre-modern era. Moving further, emergence of management thought with respect to the emergence of term manager. So, management as a field of study is unique in the sense that practice of management is ancient. While its body of knowledge that is theory is comparatively recent, however, the basic aim of management always remained the accomplishment of specific goals through effective acquisition, distribution and utilization of physical and human resources. Let us now discuss the origin of the term manager before tracing the significant developments in the earliest stages of management thought. So, the term manager has its roots in different languages. First, the Latin word manus which means by hand and also has overtones of power and jurisdiction could have been the fundamental source of the term manager. This word was widely used during Roman Empire to denote officials who had power over people and also authority to issue orders and directions. From here we can find out that those who were following all these norms of issuing orders and giving directions were the ones who were called or termed as manis. Moving further, the second word or the second language in which the word manager may have evolved from is the Italian word manageri, meaning persons in charge of production facilities was in wake during 30th, 13th century. The French word managery appeared during the 15th century as an equivalent of another French word managere. The English word manager made its appearance in the official document of 1589. So, you can see to it students that in 16th century this current contemporary term of manager evolved in English language. This term was used to indicate persons entrusted with responsibility to the upkeep of the landed estate. Moving further, the earliest texts on the management are the duties of Wazir, Sun Tzu's art of war, Confucius Analects or the sayings of Confucius, Chanakya Kautilya's Earth Shastra and Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nation in 1776. Let us discuss this early management content in detail to find out how various eras or various researchers and thinkers have contributed to the field of management thought. First, the duties of Vazis. This is a 3500 year old manual written apparently during the 18th dynasty of ancient Egypt. This book is the first written material that talks about goals and objectives of management as well as tasks of managers. It was loosely called as Wazir's in those days. Wazir was the individual who held top governmental positions in ancient Egypt and were responsible for the efficient management of physical and human resources belonging to the emperor. They were also responsible for training the younger members of emperor's family in administrative functions and affairs. So, from here students you can gather information on that even in the earlier centuries how the delegation of work was given, how the focus was on getting the things in efficient manner, how the trainings were also given to the younger members of the family or of the administrative affairs and how the emperor used to manage both the physical and the human resources well. Further highlighting Sun 
Zhu's Art of War, this Chinese classic on military strategies was written nearly 2000 years ago by top ranked military general and strategists during this Western Zhu dynasty of the late 6th century. An authoritative work was on military strategies and tactics. This book has found wide applications in formulation of business and organizational strategies. So, what is strategy? Strategy which is come from a Greek word strategos, which basically means a game plan, which is much more than planning, which includes a tactics to defeat the competitor. And that is the same thing which has been discussed by Sun Tzu's Art of War in 600 BCE. Even today, this book is the source of inspiration for managers and offers them clues and advices on how to succeed in competitive business environment. The basic content of this book has been included in the training manuals of many organizations, especially for the executive development programs. Next script that helps us understand the evolution of management thought is Confucius Analects or the saying of Confucius. This is a compilation of messages of Confucius, China's first teacher and a great philosopher. The management philosophy and practices of China were greatly influenced by Confucius teachings for thousands of years. Confucius value system and order known as five relationships of Confucianism, the five virtues and the Confucian work ethic impacted the managerial approach to the Chinese. Specifically, the five relationships explained and the appropriate behavior and role for every member of the organization is highly important to be understood. The five virtues emphasize the importance of harmony and also offers a moral framework for the society. The Confucian work ethic speaks about the importance of hard work, loyalty and dedication and frugality and a love of learning for organizational members. Next is our own Indian origin Chanakya's Kautilya's Arthashastra. This 2300 year old Indian classic discusses statecraft, the art of managing government affairs, economic policy and military strategy. It offers advice on how to establish and maintain socio-economic and political order in the country. This book insists that administrators should ensure continuous and comprehensive learning. Students, you must be now realizing that how the primitive or the previous researchers and thinkers have already focused on the contemporary management practices. How the thinkers have focused upon virtues, value systems, morals, and organizational learning patterns to be imbibed by all organizational members. They should learn to look at organizational problems from different perspectives, develop skills to think both holistically and strategically. Lastly, improve the ability to resolve conflicts by engaging various stakeholders and removing the cause of the conflict. So, as we already know, conflict is inevitable. Even people in those days could face those conflicts during the organizational settings and they have worked hard to find out ways on how to resolve these interpersonal conflicts and bring in harmony and content amongst the members who are working in a team or a group. Moving further though, Development in the field of management was slow and uneventful for long period of time in history. It was the industrial revolution of 18th century which brought about remarkable changes in management thoughts and practices. 
this period witnessed large scale replacement of manpower with the machine power and also the employment of unrelated workers worked in centralized place called factory so here is the time during the industrial revolution when the birth of places called today's factories took place and there people starting putting in their efforts to get or to convert the input into the output the output which was desired by the society the factories required people with managerial skills to create demand for their products now this critical word demand is the contemporary challenge that every organization faces how to increase or create the demand to assign tasks to workers and to direct and coordinate their activities this period also saw the emergence of new management concepts and styles such as laissez faire now what was laissez faire laissez faire was unrestricted travel and a free reign kind of leadership which should be given to the subordinates to the team members or to the organizations at large because of which they could put on their own creative ideas as well the renowned economist and management philosopher adam smith's contribution to management thought came during the earliest period of industrial revolution adam smith who is also called as father of liberal economics let us study his contribution to the field of management adam smith wrote the wealth of nation in 1776 he is the father of liberal economics and brought about a revolution in economic thought by suggesting that market and competition should be the regulators of any economic activity he also suggested that the state should adopt a hands off policy towards business economic management the approach may differently be called as non intervention free enterprise or economic liberalism so here you can see to it that adam smith also proposed the same concept which was proposed by his predecessors that we have to go for laissez faire or free reign kind of leadership style or free reign leadership uh, free reign free enterprise economic liberalism according to him wealth consisted of goods that all people could consume so he looked to promote the wealth of whole nation and not the interest of any particular class he suggested that any public policy that improves the standard of living of poor people and is a good policy and any policy which decreases the standard of living of any poor people is a bad policy so he focused on the policies for upliftment of poorer classes and he also advocated the concept of division of labor and increased the standard of living of people in the society this means that manufacturing process is divided into distinct and simple operations so that division of labor can be conducted and then delegated to particular workers or machines to perform that task this is the focus on division of labor such division can lead to workers specialization which in turn can improve improve organizational productivity employees skills dexterity and judgment so here adam smith has advocated that what could be the multiple benefits of having division of labor enhancement of skill of workers dexterity of workers and employee productivity at large moving further let us have some insight into the approaches to the management thought even though the practices of management in ancient management formal study is comparatively a recent phenomenon the late 19th and early 20th centuries have witnessed some important developments in the field of management 
For instance, renowned management theories such as scientific management theory, the general administrative theory were introduced during the period. Since then, several other approaches to management have also been developed by management writers and practitioners. For the sake of easier and better understanding, these approaches have been classified into four categories. As illustrated in the picture, you can see that the first approach is classical approach, behavioral approach, quantitative approach and contemporary approach. The classical approach focuses on the efficiency of the management process, how we can make the management process highly efficient. The second approach is the behavioral approach which talks about the organizational behavioral patterns where individual, group and organization behavior is thought of how to modify the same so as to get the appropriate outcomes or the modified behavior. The third approach is the quantitative approach which talks about utilizing the mathematical models in order to improve the organizational processes and decision making pattern. The fourth approach talks about contemporary approaches which is broadly the situational approaches to the management. Let us now see what are the further sub theories in each of these approaches and try to explain those theories in detail. Under the theories of classical approach, the first one is scientific management theory, administrative theories and bureaucratic theories. Then we move on to behavioral approach that is Hawthorne studies, sci behavioral science theories, management science theories and total quality management in quantitative approach while system theory and contingency theory in contemporary approaches. And the contemporary approaches include systems theory and contingency theory. The various classical theorists include the scientific management theorists are F. W. Taylor, Frank and Lillian Gilbert and Henry Gantt. General administrative theorists under classical approach include Henry Fiol and the bureaucratic theorists are is Max Weber. Let us study in detail the theories given by these various scientists. The earliest attempt to study understand and perform management in a scientific and systematic manner was made by Frederick Wilslow Taylor. Taylor who joined a common laborer in 1878 rose to an engineer and manufacturing manager during his career. He worked in several companies such as Midwale Steel Company, Simmons Rolling Machine and Bethlehem Steel Company. In his book Principles of Management, Taylor insists that there is one right way available for performing the job in the most efficient manner. However, this right way to do the job should be determined only by experts who have a scientific understanding of the job in this regard he called for redesigning of jobs and change in attitude of workers towards the job for achieving maximum efficiency. Further, Taylor also employed the scientific analysis and experiments to develop the one best way in task accomplishment. The development of one best way for different jobs enabled Taylor to achieve nearly 200% increase in the productivity on a continuous basis in his organization. Job design, work layout, task scheduling are some aspects of production where his influence is still felt. He has been acknowledged as the father of scientific management for replacing informal rule of thumb and intuition with scientific management principles 
and techniques. He believed in increasing the efficiency could achieve by selecting the right people for the job and training them in one best way. He also focused on motivating workers and favored the incentive wage plans and separated managerial work from the operative work. The experiment that Taylor did was to find out that how best he can find out the one best way to put in the big irons on the rail. So what he did earlier the workers used to put in 12.5 tons of pig irons on the rail carrier and after finding out the one best way and working with the equipment design and tool designing he could find out that he can have this rise in productivity up to 47 or 48 tons of pig irons can be placed in the same time as against the 12.5 pig irons which used to be placed earlier. So this is the benefit of finding out the one best way and optimizing the work performance. Now let us understand the Taylor's principles of scientific management. So Taylor has given four principles of scientific management. First, develop a science of each element for an individual's work which replaces the old rule of thumb method. So he wanted to or he actually experimented to find out how scientifically we can reduce the dependence on the old rules of measurements where we do not have the accuracy in measurement so as a result we cannot expect the accurate outcome as well. Second, he focused on scientifically selecting and training the individuals, finding out the gaps in their performances and giving right kind of training to the members in organization so that they are upskilled and they are able to perform as expected or as the standards are given to them. Then third he focused on hearty cooperation between the members of the organization where he focused on having a team spirit between the members. This team spirit was inculcated and boosted with the help of having high motivational and morale boosting practices in organization. So workers so as to ensure that all work is done in accordance with principles of science that has been developed. Further, he focused on dividing the work and responsibility equally between the management and the operative workers. So he tried to bridge in the gap between the blue collar and the white collar workers and focused on having a equality pattern or division of work according to the, the uh, profile of each operative or the managerial level worker. Moving further now let us try to understand what other researchers and scientists have contributed to the field of scientific management. In this line we have Frank and Lillian Gilbert. Management thinkers like Frank Henry Gantt and Frank and Lillian Gilbert have worked on scientific management theories to make it more sensible and acceptable. Frank and Lillian Gilbert for example, they worked on ways to improve productivity and reduce the fatigue. In this regard, they focused on the workers movements to identify and eliminate the wasteful motion thus reducing job related fatigue. They were also involved in designing and developing proper tools and equipments for achieving the optimum work performance. Now here Frank and Lillian Gilbert was an husband and wife team who did lot of time and motion studies and one of the very fam famous time and motion studies are bricklaying activities where they tried to identify what could be the best way to lay a brick in terms of physical dexterity and movement of the hands in such a manner that the brick is laid in minimum possible time with optimum efficiency and the effort is not tiring on the part of the worker. So thus Frank and Lillian Gilbert 
came up with such time and motion efforts which could tomorrow become the one best ways of doing the things as proposed by the F.W. Taylor. In the same motion study where Frank and Lillian Gilbert did the bricklaying activity, they also uh, found out that the efficiency rose up to a very highest level as initially the inter exterior bricks were laid 18 in 1 minute, they were reduced to 2 and in the interior brick laying activity the 18, the 18 number was reduced to 5. So this is the optimization of work measurement or work process that they could do because of the time and motion study. Moving on to Henry Gantt. Henry Gantt came up with the incentive compensation system. This incentive compensation was also called as the differential piece rate system given by the Henry Gantt. This differential piece rate system was in addition to what Taylor has proposed as the incentive system for the workers. In differential piece rate system, Henry Gantt focused upon a standard output and proposed that the wages over and above the normal wages will be given to the workers who will achieve this standard output. But in case they are not able to achieve the standard output, then there is a uh, plan that they may not get the desired output. So for example, if 30 units is the standard output, for those workers who do 30 units and above, they will get rupees 10 as bonus and for those workers who will do less than 30 units, they may get rupees 5 as the piece rate system. So this is how differential piece rate system was given by Henry Gantt. Henry Gantt also came up with a Gantt chart for scheduling of work operations. Now in this Gantt chart, he came up with a system of having a calendar or schedule for the activities where on one side various activities were written, on the other hand side or on the other axis time in weeks or months was allocated and for every activity you could plan or schedule how you wish to complete in what time so that you can complete your job in a timely manner. Moving on from Henry Gantt and Frank and Lillian, Lillian Gilbert's techniques, we now move on to the second category of theories under the classical theory approach that is the general administrative theories. General administrative theories include contribution by Henry Fiol. Henry Fiol who suggested good management practices for managers is regarded as the father of modern operational management. He developed a holistic view of management by looking at it from a total organizational perspective. This is in contrast to Taylor's scientific management theory which is largely influenced by production problems and perspectives. In his book General and Industrial Management in 1916, Fiol has explained what managers should do and what principles they should follow. In this regard, he first classifies the activities of the organization into six broad categories. So the categories include first as technical, then commercial, financial and security. So here he tried to focus on that the technical aspect of the organization is the production part of it that needs to be focused on. The commercial part is production and selling of the finished products. The financial part is about mobilizing the capital of the organization and the security is protection of the properties. Along with all these, the fifth one that he came up with the, was the accounting aspect. An accounting aspect was about gathering and dissemination of financial information. 
the last activity that he identified was of managerial nature or the managerial activity which means planning and organizing. He then focused on managerial activity for further analysis. It is here when he tried to find out and gave all of us the contemporary 14 principles of management or what we also call as fundamental or universal principles of management practices. This is a great contribution by Henry Fiol. <clears throat> Let us now move on and try and understand what are these 14 principles of management. As you can see on your screen, there are 14 principles written. So, we shall be taking one by one each of these principles to understand. Fiol believed that management is a unique activity applicable to all kinds of institutions and activities including business organization, government and households. According to him, there are six primary managerial functions and what are the six primary managerial functions? They include forecasting that is identifying the future needs and requirements, planning that we have already discussed in the previous session to schedule, then organizing that is how things have to be done and resource allocation commanding that is leading or giving directions, coordinating that is having a connect between all the processes that take place and a complementing processes between all and finally controlling. Controlling is evaluating the performance. Further he started mentioning that in order to have good amount of forecasting right kind of planning, appropriate organizing, right commanding and direction, appropriate coordination and finally an effective controlling. We can do all of these activities with the help of these 14 principles of management. So, let us try and see these 14 principles of management. The very first principle talks about division of labor. This refers to the splitting up of productive process into different components or parts. Division of labor leads to specialization as each worker performs the same tasks with increased frequency. Here the focus has to be given on increased frequency and this is called as nothing but specialization in turn helps them in achieving higher output with the same effort. So, when we are talking about splitting of the various tasks, we have to identify those tasks which are similar in nature. When we group the tasks which are similar in nature, we are able to split them in different groups and each person then who has got a specialized knowledge of doing that may in turn get the output as desired. So, this is the benefit of division of labor. Second principle of management that he focuses upon is authority. Now, what is authority? Authority is the power which is vested in the position. This is the power to make decisions and power to give the orders. So, here Henry Fuel focused on that every position must have right kind of authority or power so that they can get the work done by the subordinates. So, that the delegation of this authority can be given to the subordinates if needed or required. It is the right to give the orders. Authority is essential for managers to work to get the work done through the workers. However, the manager's authority must be accompanied with the corresponding responsibility. If corresponding responsibility is not assigned with the authority, then the authority goes waste or futile. 
in any case we need to have authority to complete the responsibility so such tasks or responsibility to be assigned first and the kind of responsibility which is assigned to the subordinate or to a team member or a worker accordingly the authority should be vested in the position further the third principle that henry fuel mentioned was about discipline here he focused on having good observance of rules and regulations by the workers where henry fuel actually emphasized on that there has to be judgment of punishments also for those workers who are not following the given rules and regulations in the organization so here also there are agreements made with management with respect to observations of rules and regulations in this regard fuel insisted on fair and clear agreements between the individuals next is unity of command unity of command here henry fuel focused on that one should give the command to one officer should come from one boss only if there are multiple bosses then there is a possibility that the person concerned may fall into ambiguity or may have some role conflict that which boss or which order i have to follow so unity of command is very much essential in order to have a synchronized and complementary efforts in the organization so it refers to employees receiving instructions from only one supervisor while executing their tasks in the event of an employee receiving orders from multiple supervisors or managerial authority employee discipline and organizational stability may be affected so here we need to understand that one point already we have given as employee discipline to be followed and if we do not follow the unity of command then probably that chain of discipline or the concept of discipline will be diluted hence unity of command goes hand in hand with discipline also it will be easier for one single boss to manage and put the performance of the subordinate in right track and use the or utilize the appropriate disciplinary actions if needed the fifth principle of management that henry fuel has focused upon is unity of direction unity of direction here means that we need to have a common vision shared vision in the organization as you have seen a magnet and the iron fillings the iron fillings get attached to the magnet well similarly the vision of the organization should be such which may call which we may call as a shared vision that employees should be attached to that vision and all should move in the same direction whether it is the manager whether it is the operatives or whether it is the top management all should be aligned towards one direction for movement and all efforts should be put in though in that particular direction only so that ultimate organizational goal is achieved so unity of direction refers to the presence of one head or leader and one plan to guide all the organizational or group activities that have the same purpose and the common goal this should avoid any possible confusion and inconsistencies in the messages and instruction given to the employees the next principle of management is subordination of individual interest to the general interest now what do we understand by this in organization employees are employed they are being paid wages compensation benefits etc they also come up with their personal goals and similarly the organization also has its own goal now what henry fuel focused upon that the individuals should keep their goals at the subordinate level and they must keep the organizational level goals as a priority now what will happen 
if an employee is focusing on the organizational goal the result is his personal growth automatically takes place because it will have a cascading effect if you achieve the organizational goal your personal goals will already be achieved accordingly so thus organizational citizenship behavior is one pattern which needs to be focused on by the managers in order to inculcate subordination of individual interest to the organizational interest now what is organizational citizenship behavior it is a feeling of commitment and connect with the organization or place of work as you feel connected towards your motherland in the similar manner the organization which is giving you respect status recognition salary you should have that commitment in your thought processes and that commitment should reflect in your work pattern as well so in this subordination of individual interest henry fuel meant that the interest of an individual employee should not take precedence over the overall organizational interest if there is any conflict between the interest of an individual employee and that of the organization employees should sacrifice their own interest for the sake of well-being of the organization as a whole so the emphasis here is that the employee has to focus on reducing their interest or maybe sacrificing their interest for organizational gain the next principle that henry fuel focuses on is about the remuneration now what is remuneration remuneration is the wage or the compensation that an employee gets out of the efforts that he has put in for the organizational work henry fuel focused on that this is the primary activity for which any employee starts earning or gets a job so it is mandatorily required on the part of the organization to focus on right kind of remuneration according to the efforts put in by the manager or the worker should be given to them which actually places or makes a basis for a right motivation or morale boosting approach for workers so here henry fuel referred to fixation of remuneration in such a way that it satisfies not only the employees but also their employers while compensating the employees for their work the business conditions of the organization this is an important aspect value of employees and mode of payment should be given adequate considerations so here three things that henry fuel focused upon that what is the mode of payment how the remuneration is being given to the employees second he focused upon the value of the employee now here value of the employee is not the person per se but it is the skill that the employee carries what is the worthiness of that skill and third the business conditions of the organization that how or what is the financial health of the organization so while fixing the remuneration these factors are to be considered in detail next principle of management that henry fuel talked about is centralization now centralization with respect to decision making here it talked about the degree to which employees are involved in decision making so that means if employees are highly involved in decision making then we have low centralization and if the employees are not much involved in the decision making then we have high centralization so here each organization has certain degree of centralization depending on its size so this is one factor and the skill or the level of the manager that is another factor which will decide upon the degree of centralization further he says that the degree of centralization will increase when the subordinates are less involved in the decision making in contrast the degree of decentralization will increase if employees are more involved in such decisions 
now in what all situations we go for high degree of centralization or low degree of cent uh, centralization for strategic decisions we go for high degree of centralizations and for non strategic more of operative decisions we go for low degree of centralization right let us now move on to the ninth principle of management that is scalar chain. So, in scalar chain the uh, scientist Henry Fiol actually focused upon that there has to be a channel of communication which is appropriately explained and known by all the members and all top to bottom and bottom up communication should be made as per this channel of communication or the hierarchical levels. If need be then this channel can have a bridge in between in urgent or contingent situations which is called as a gang plan. So, the gang plan can be introduced if the requirement is there to break the communication in urgent situations. Then comes the 10th principle given by Henry Fiol which is called as order. Now, what is order? Here Henry Fiol focused on that there should be a place for everyone and everyone should be at their own place. Further he added on that there should be a place for everything and everything should be at the right place. This is what he meant by saying that there has to be an order in the organization. So, whether it is the arrangement of people or material in the organization, a proper place for everything and everything at a proper place must be there. When every person is at a proper place, he called it as a human order. When every material thing was at a place, it called it as a material order. Then the 11th principle he talked about equity. He always advocated fairness, just and equality amongst all members of the organization. So, the same thing he proposed in the 11th principle of management that is equity where he said that warmth, justice, kindness, friendliness in the relationship between the employees and employer should always be there. In this regard, managers must treat all employees equally and impartially to inspire their confidence and faith in the management. The twelfth principle that Henry Fiol focused upon is the stability of tenure of employees. Stability of ten tenure means that we have to give job security to the employees. If good amount of job security is there, the employee will be highly connected to the organization or what we may say that OCB will be high in the employee. The thirteenth principle that Henry Fiol talked about is initiative. Here it referred to the capability of employee to design, develop and plan successfully. Management must encourage employees to take initiatives and within the limits of their authority. They should invent new ideas, try new experiments, develop better techniques and improve the job performance. So, basically in today's time more focus to be given on research and development according to the principle of initiative by the Henry Fiol. And finally, the last principle of management as given by Henry Fiol is Espirite de Corps which means unity is strength. So, Mr. Henry Fiol focuses on that in organization people should have high amount of interpersonal connect with each other and as a result there will be harmony. This harmony can do wonders and magics in organizational settings. So, leaders and subordinates should work as a strong team with good amount of affinity with each other. Group cohesiveness to be higher. So, finally, it says union is strength and develop a sense of belongingness and oneness amongst the employees. So, students what we have discussed today it includes 
the evolution of management thought wherein we discussed theories like classical approach to management and under which we discussed the scientific management theories along with the administrative theory given by Henry Fiol. I hope you have understood this concept and this is all for the session 3. Thank you to all.